Mm. It's actually funny. Like, an over 40s series, it's actually just how I think everyone should train. <laughs> but funnily enough, it just happens to be how I do train people that are over 40 because they just often mentally don't want to do the stupid things that people in their 20s are actually doing with their health and fitness. Yeah. Um, so it just gets framed in that way, but it's actually the methodology I would use across the board. Um, it's all around maximizing what we do, but minimizing what we don't want. That's really it across any of the metrics. Nutrition, stress, um, sleep, exercise, cardio, strength. It, it, it actually doesn't matter, but most people just try to maximize their output without any real care or respect for the repercussions of that. And that's um, that's kind of how most people standardize their programs. So today we're going to talk specifically about strength training. Now, what do I normally see? Well, a couple of things. Most people are pretty stiff and sore. That's almost every single person that I talk to that's trying to get their health on track. Man, lower back would be pretty common. They're either injured or they don't want to be injured or they don't want to be injured again because it's either been a, themselves or another PT or another gym that's done that and they're looking for a bit more guidance or they're not sure how to get results or like more specifically to strength training, how to train and what strength training is and how that relates to their results. So today we want to, we want to clear a few of those things up, sort of give some guidance around what we deem as kind of best practice in that strength training method and why we think it's so important to people. And um, hopefully along the way today, we can talk a little bit about mobility and sort of individual programming that addresses weaknesses. I definitely want to touch on volume, which is a pretty thrown about word, but I'll give you what that means later. Frequency of training, tempo, and training that addresses someone's allostatic load or overall stress load is all that means. That's what we're talking about today. And chime in whenever you want and ask me as many questions as you'd like. Question for you, Jeffrey. I'll actually just, what's your, what's your idea around like, you know, you've, you've gotten in, I know your journey pretty well, but like why, if you were going to advise somebody as to why they should do strength training, what would you say? Um, I, th I think probably from, from two aspects, the personal aspect of just how you feel, how it improves your kind of for someone like my age, 54, moving through the world, fe feeling fit and strong. And, but, um, the psychological value of thinking I can I can do tough stuff, but then I think from the scientific side of it, looking at Peter Atiyah's work around the importance of strength training as you get you know kind of forties, fifties, and 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 onwards in terms of longevity. Yeah, it's so incredibly important. Um, it's definitely one of the foundational pillars of any good overall health program but like by a mile so there are a couple but strength training is definitely one of them like when we think about people sort of middle age it's there's a couple of things that kind of happen some people think some people get a little bit lazy some people get a bit complacent with their health but i often think like just the demands and responsibility of life kind of gets pretty overwhelming for people and you know, family or kids or work or partners or anything else, looking after family, they're all pretty big responsibilities. And I think finding the time, so to speak, or being able to have a system that prioritizes, prioritizes your health is super difficult. And I think that just ends up leading to some of the, the outcomes that we see really the, the weight gain and, and a few other things, um, so today, you know, we want to talk about why strength training is so important and how to incorporate it, really. But I want to talk about it from a lens of the reason the body just gets rid of muscle, really. It's one of the biggest contributing factors um, 
to people not living a good vitality, like living with good vitality and having good health later in life. And the reason people, the body gets rid of it is because it's so metabolically expensive. Like I don't people really think about it from that lens for the body. It's kind of a, a nice to have not an absolute essential marker. Unfortunately, it's never going to prioritize muscle over organ function or brain function. So unless we're actually giving us, putting ourselves in a state to be able to keep it, the body's happy to get rid of it. Skeletal muscle actually has, it's actually a pretty low metabolic rate, but it's 10 to 15 calories per kilo per day, which isn't nothing, but comparatively to the brain or vital organs, they vary between 200 and about 450, 500 calories per kilo per day, which is astronomical. But it shows just how metabolically active your organs and your brain are and just how much energy they require to do the things that they need to do. I want you to think of this. This is the analogy I like to use when it comes to uh, muscle wastage, really. Your body sort of scans itself regularly. Now, the older we get, the more efficient it becomes at this scanning. So like I want you to think maybe in your 20s, it does an overall scan, you know, maybe once a quarter. In your 30s, once a month. In your 40s, once a fortnight. In your 50s, weekly. And in your 60s, probably every other day. What your body's scanning for is... What am I, what do I not need? What am I, what hasn't been used in whatever the scanning time period is? And what can I get rid of? As you get older, your body's just trying to become more efficient with itself comparatively to when you're in your 20s. It's got so much spare battery, as I like to say, that gets less and less and less as we age. So your body just gets more efficient, more efficient, more efficient with getting rid of things that it doesn't deem necessary. Now, if you don't do any strength training or if you don't have a good, like, approach to training your body will then get rid of things that it doesn't deem necessary one of those could be muscle and that happens a lot as people age and it's one of the prevalent reasons for sort of sarcopenia as people age now like why do we even care about muscle wastage well for what as you said before jeffrey we care about it for a bunch of reasons one of them it's one of the key markers for long-term health and longevity and it does a whole bunch of things. It actually decreases your all-cause mortality risk, it strength training, I should say. And then it also increases your muscle mass. It increases overall mobility and functionality. It's going to improve your bone health. Believe it or not, it helps with cognitive function. It improves your glucose control and your nutrient sensitivity. It definitely improves your hormonal profile. And it helps preserve your metabolic rate. So strength training and then by proxy, the muscle mass that it tends to add is one of the best strategies that I know of to help you age with confidence. But in terms of a more goal-centric piece for people, by adding in the strength training and then the muscle mass that should accompany such a training type, it actually helps you like decrease the the weight that you want to be at. It's one of the best ways to tone up, let's say. It's the best way to maintain a weight because it increases your body's overall energy output, which means to maintain a weight with more muscle mass means it's easier to stay there, which is one of the big things that like runners or lots of cardio people don't quite get because they lose a lot of weight. But when they're losing weight, a big portion of that is muscle mass, which drives down their metabolism, which means when they get to whatever weight they're at, it's harder to stay there because metabolically, they just don't have the output anymore, which leads to my second point. It makes it harder to have a balanced diet in that state. The more muscle mass you have, the more calories you burn on a daily basis, the less impact some nutrient dense and some processed foods will have on your body. Muscle mass is really sensitive, especially to insulin, and it really helps manage your blood sugar, and it really helps put you in an optimal health profile from a hormonal perspective, but a metabolically metabolic perspective, which means you get less impact from some of the things that might impact you, like alcohol, like high-calorie foods and sort of takeaways. And most people I talk to, that's what they mean by balance, though. They want to be toned and they want to have balance with their nutrition, which means 
they want to be able to have some things that they really enjoy, but without a massive consequence to that action and muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And then the strength training that gets you there is one of the big things on how to do that. So there's actually a couple of things that I want to think about in regards to how you approach or think about your strength training, which most people get wrong, if I'm being brutally honest. Number one is I want you to unlock your mobility and power to stay injury-free. Now, most people in their 40s, could be late 30s, seems to, I'd almost say everything's almost half a decade to a decade earlier these days. Most people are quite stiff and quite sore. And this often comes from a lack of mobility and muscular imbalances, which have either built, been built up over time or from an incomplete program. So this, so good mobility and good stability is actually the foundation of any program. It is the thing that will help you move better, avoid injury, and unlock more power in your workouts. So when I'm working with athletes, because you know they're a pretty easy cross-section who typically think they want more power or more output from whatever they're doing, often I'll look at what imbalances do they have, what mobility issues do they have, and what stability do they need to have to create a better foundation so that they can unlock the power that's there. They'll say a lot, well, I'm stronger, I'm faster, I can jump higher. You've done all this stuff. I actually haven't done anything yet. Normally, I've just increased their mobility. I've made their body less imbalanced and I've got their stability to be higher, which gives you access to power that you already had, but your body can't access. So that's why it's the foundation of any program, regardless of who it is. What does that actually look like though? Well, it kind of depends. Somewhere between 20 and 80% of someone's workout should incorporate this. Now, depending on where they're at, you know, 80% might be as someone starts in the gym and as they get more balanced and, um, you know, more stable and more mobile, we can reduce that within their workout. But there'll always be a portion of it in every workout because it's one of the key metrics for all around good health. And normally I'll do this at the start of the workout. This could be anything from, you know, a backwards drag is actually quite a good mobilizer and a stabilizer. It could be anything to do with the sort of glute, glute made hip area. It could be anything to do with the sort of scaps and the rotator cuffs. Like they should be in your workout regularly. They should be in every weekly plan. Now I want you to think mobility is more than just stretching though. Static stretching is probably the worst mobilizer that I know of. I want you to think a lot of stiffness and tightness in your body actually comes from tight, weak muscles. So let's take the hip flexor, for example, right at the front of the hips. It's often tight on people and it's tight and weak. It's tight from being in a sitting position at a desk often, but it's weak as well. So it takes a lot of load from that. Now, we... The best way to actually lengthen it, you can do some stretching. It does help significantly. Dynamic stretching will help even more. But an exercise like the split squat will be even more beneficial than everything before it. And the reason that is, is in that position, it's actually going to stretch the hip flexor while putting tension and load through it, which is going to strengthen it. And then as it gets stronger, the body realizes that it doesn't need to tighten up so much and it's not a weak link in the chain which causes less tightness in the muscle. So when I'm assessing a tight, tight muscle, I'll often assess how weak the muscle is as well to see if it really is just needs to be loosened or whether there's actually an underlying imbalance in there that we can work on, which will reduce the overall tightness in the body. The reason the split squat's the example is what we're trying to get in our mobility is we want the nervous system to be involved in the process. The reason static stretching um, is inefficient is because, you know, if we're just doing a chest stretch, it just kind of stretches the muscle. Then as we stop, it kind of rebounds back into the position that it was in. It's because there's been no nervous system role in that movement. The reason yoga does so well, the reason that even dynamic stretching does so well is because the initiation of the nervous system actually tells the body that it needs to change the homeostasis of where that muscle is. So the length of that muscle, which is where good strength training comes into play. 
if you have a good strength training program that actually trains the movement properly, it will initiate the nervous system to respond. And as the nervous system responds, it changes the length of the muscle or tells the body to change the length of the muscle and actually stay there, not just rebound and shorten back up again. And that is one of the key benefits of a strength training program when it's programmed properly. So like rotator cuff, this could be internal and external rotation. Could be anything to do with the scapula. Like for your thoracic, we would add in squatting or deadlifting because as you're, especially with a goblet, if you're here and actually squeezing those scapulas and keeping a vertical torso as you go through the movement, you're generating so much mobility through that upper back um, which works a treat in terms of actually increasing your mobility and your range of motion. For your hip, we'd be looking at everything to do with your glute med, your adductor or your groin, your hip flexor, and then at the top of your quad, you've got your rec fem. In your torso, we've got muscles like your QL and your oblique, which are right on the side of your body, and they help with rotational work. If you tick all of those, honestly, you'll build such a robust foundation for movement that you'll severely reduce how many aches, pains, niggles, tightness, and injuries that you get just in day-to-day, -day, let alone in any training that you have. The other one, and everyone neglects this, is recovering from your actual strength training workout. Just <laughs> the amount of people that run out the door, I'll do it at home, I'll, I'll, I'll do it later, I promise. Ne never gets done. Like as you as, as the body ages like recovery just becomes more crucial like we've as we said we've just got less battery to prioritize things so it just needs to be really efficient in what it does what we're actually trying to do with our recovery is maximize the actual benefit that we've just got from our training so i want you to think the training and any training is just the catalyst it, it allows your body we're just trying to give enough stimulus to be able to get whatever it is that we're trying to do. That's what the training's for. It doesn't matter whether it's running, doesn't matter whether it's strength work, like catalyst. Recovery is where all the adaptation happens. So it starts immediately after the training session is actually complete. Gold standard would be 15 minutes. I know that everybody doesn't have 15 minutes, but I want to give you what the gold standard is. You want to do something that down regulates your nervous system because as you train and as you do strength training, you exhaust the nervous system a little bit. You're in a really dominant fight or flight mode while you're training and you're producing all sorts of metabolic byproducts. What we want to do when we finish is shift the nervous system over to a more rest and digest state so we can actually start to adapt and recover. So anything down regulating, we want to start some dynamic stretching would be good. This could be like foam rolling. This could be any ball release work, any banded stretching. The Theragun is really amazing. Could also be a small yoga flow. It could also be some down-regulating breath work where you inhale and then you exhale for twice as long as you inhale, which is going to really get your vagus nerve stimulated and get you into a more rest and digest state. The sauna, amazing. What it's going to do is shift your nervous system into that rest and digest state, which is going to prioritize everything to do with recovery, whether it's rebooting your nervous system to be able to in, um, initiate the power that we've just done, whether it's actually get your body to get into rest and digest so that it can actually start to prioritize protein synthesis to rebuild the muscle or to put it into a state where when you actually finish working out, your cortisol is quite high to drop that cortisol so that you can flip over and actually go into more fat burning mode. What I want you to actually think of with recovery is when you forego your cool down in your recovery, what you're actually saying to yourself is I don't mind getting, um, not getting the best results from my workouts. That's what you're saying. It's when I don't do recovery, I don't mind getting the best results. I don't mind getting the best out of what I just did in that session, whether it's building strength, building muscle or staying injury free. Nice little thing to think about. It's not, people often think oh, it's not a big deal. And they think about their coach or, you're not cheating us. Like it's not my body. It's not my results. You're cheating yourself. Whether it's the tightness that you feel the next day, whether it's the results that you're after, it's in the actions that you do or don't do. So when you're thinking about, should I warm up? It's your injuries that you're preventing. It's, should I do the technique properly? It's, 
your strength that you're trying to build. It's should I do the cool down? It's your adaptation that you're trying to get uh, and the recovery that you're trying to then benefit from. Not mine, not your coaches, not the facility that you're working with. So that's a nice way to sort of frame it for yourself to try and make better choices, really. And it doesn't have to be 15 minutes. That would just be the gold standard. You could just do a minute of some dynamic stretching and 30 seconds of breath work, and you're going to significantly improve where your nervous system's at in relation to where it was at to then start promoting some exercise, uh, some actual recovery. Number two is I want you to train smarter, not harder. Training, <laughs> training in general, but training after 40 isn't about pushing harder. It's about training with intention. Most people though, and this is where I have empathy because most people don't have the skills to be able to train with intention. So they lift really heavy. They do lots of reps. They shorten their rest periods. They make sure their heart rate's elevated. They make sure they've got a really big lactic burn because it's easier to do that than train efficiently and train with an intention. That requires a really high level of skill, which is why I have lots of empathy for people. Now, what do I mean by train with intention? I mean, learn how to adjust your workout volume, learn the frequency that matters for you, and learn that the tempo that you need for the unique exercises based on your unique needs. This will ensure you get the maximum amount of results with minimum wear and tear on the body. That's what a good program is actually trying to do. So I want you to understand how to train in alignment with your lifestyle and the amount of stress you're under or the allostatic load that you've got so that you can see overall progress without overloading your system. Now that just takes time and normally coaching and guidance, but being aware about it is we're looking for progress, not perfection. So like there's two kinds of things. You need to periodize your training program, clearly, about every four to six weeks, but it kind of depends on where someone's at. And there's kind of a couple of things you're after. If you want a new program, that helps with variety, helps with motivation, but it doesn't have to be a whole new program. Honestly, you could just slightly change your program up. That works a treat. Like a few different exercises, a few different rep ranges. You can almost progress an A to a B to a C version of the same program. That works tremendous as well. Not everybody wants a whole new program. It means a whole new set of exercises to learn, which comes with other challenges like do I feel comfortable doing the exercises? Do I understand the technique from those exercises? Do I not feel like an idiot doing them in the gym? Like there's lots of different things that people need to consider when they're doing a new program. It could even be the same program, just set up differently with a different circuit or slightly different exercises within it. And that, that would work tremendously well. The We're trying to just tailor the structured program to maximize the benefit of the result. That's really important when you think about your program i want you to kind of think of this four six eight weeks whatever your program is you've normally got three workouts if you're doing a three day a week program it kind of gives you four to six to eight times depending on how many weeks it is to actually progress in each workout it's not really about duration ever the durations are relevant in most programs but the frequency of how you get progress within the exercises matters a lot so next time you feel like skipping a day or you don't feel like giving it your all or anything like that, or you're not maximizing the workout, again, you've only got four to six to eight times to get the benefit out of whatever it is that we're trying to achieve. And that's really important when you're trying to frame results from a phase, if that makes sense. What we want to do is we want to change, um, we want to train, sorry, with precision. So I was talking about it before. We want to, it requires deliberate, focus on tempo, muscular activation, and neuromuscular stimulation. The, the goal of your workout or your strength workout is to engage the muscles efficiently while protecting the joints and minimizing unnecessary wear and tear on the body. By incorporating proper technique, pausing, and controlling intensity, what you're going to do is you're going to ensure that every rep and every set delivers maximum results without overloading your system. What we want to do is smart training is all about creating a strong connection between the brain and the body 
that ensures that you're fully engaged throughout the movement. So what do people usually do? Well, we've already discussed it. They get the lactic burn, they get their heart rate up, they reduce their rest periods. They just train as hard as they can until they're a sweaty mess on the floor. And then they leave the gym and then about an hour later, they're pretty much in a coma because they're so unenergized and fatigued from the intensity of their workouts. You should actually feel pretty energized from your workouts, especially your strength workouts. Like there's three things that I really want to talk about. Correct technique. So precision in your movements reduces the risk of injury and maximizes the benefit of each rep. That, that's actually what you're trying to get out of each rep. The rep, the actual rep counts for nothing. I don't care if it's one, two, three, like they are irrelevant for me. It's what we're getting out of each one, two, and three that actually produces the benefit that we're trying to get, which I think people forget. I want you to think of maintaining control through every phase, the eccentric, the isometric, and the concentric. Underutilized way to train. Honestly, most PTs, let alone most clients, do not understand how to create intensity through technique and tempo. It's really difficult. So it's not a blight on anybody. It's just you need to learn it to be able to maximize what you're doing. Tempo, as we're discussing. So you want to slow your lifts down. Like a full repetition should take four to five seconds often. What it's going to do is it's going to increase the amount of time under tension, which gives your body's neural ability to actually activate the muscle, which is really important. This actually is causing it to adapt. Pausing is really important. As much as it's not a very fun way to train and it actually makes the movements harder, it actually helps recruit more stabilizing muscles, which ensures the load is distributed throughout the body. That is one of their key roles. They disperse tension to places that it should go rather than if they don't activate, it will often go into soft tissue, ligament, joint, tendon. I want you to think slow and controlled, not fast and jolty with your training. A really advanced thing that I want people to think about is I want you to increase the volume and intensity of your workouts smartly. So I want you to progress incrementally with your volume within your sessions. There's, and most people just think volume, they think progressive overload, they're just gonna think weight. Let's just put more weight into more sets, into more movements more often. It's an easy way to track how you're going, but it, it often comes with a trade-off. And the trade-off is the more weight you put on things and the more exhausted you get, it normally comes at the cost of your tempo, your technique, and your recovery, which then inadvertently actually doesn't actually promote the progress that we're trying to achieve. The hard part about this training is actually leaving your ego at the door. Most people care way too much about what everyone else in the gym is thinking to be able to actually do exercises at an appropriate way. But does somebody's thinking matter more than your own well-being? Half the time, they're not even thinking about you. And if you're in a gym that does do that, I advise you not to be in a gym like that. It's not a positive environment for your health. So what else do I mean? So like if I was doing sort of three sets of a workout or sorry, of a of an exercise or a, a superset early on, my actual workout, I'll give it to you from yesterday, was my first superset of my workout is a reverse lunge into a chin-up. Now I want to increase the volume, but I want to do it through ramping which means I'm just going to incrementally increase how intense each set is. One, it warms my body up, but two, it makes it really specific on what I'm trying to do in each set. My first set of reverse lunges was just body weight, and my first set of chin-ups I did with a red band. Neither of these are going to elicit a huge response in my body, but I'm not trying to get that set to do that. I'm trying to get it to warm my body up. I'm trying to get my body used to the movements. I'm trying to get neurological activation into my body. I'm trying to get the right muscular activation to happen. I'm trying to make sure my stabilizers are switched on and engaged. I'm trying to make sure I don't have any aches, pains, and niggles in joints or soft tissue that I don't want to be there. Big win for me. And really mentally, it's super easy to start my workout like that rather than being like, wow, it needs to be hard and heavy straight away. My second set on my reverse lunges, just a set of 10 kilos. And then I switched my band to a yellow band. 
The reps at this stage were just 10 per side and then five for the chin-ups. On my last and third set, I then ramped it up 16 kilos each hand for the dumbbells. And I actually increased my reps by four each leg to make it 18 total. I then did free weight on my chin up and just did a max set of chin ups to figure out exactly how many I could do with the right tempo, with a pause at the top, with my chin above the bar and three seconds lowering with good form. As soon as I started to round in my back or I felt like I was jolty, I, I stopped the movement. That for me personally is the right amount of intensity to be able to get the most out of my movements without putting my body into disrepute and actually affecting my recovery process. That's what I mean by actually initiating the volume of your workout so that you can actually maximize the results. Which set are you going to do it in? Which exercise do you want to actually push it? Is today a day that I'm going to push it? And if it is, where am I going to do that? And if you start thinking about that, the body needs far less intense stimulation than you think. It just needs really calculated stimulus at the right times in your workout. Often the last set of whatever you're doing or the second last set will be the perfect place to do this. It initiates the catalyst, which means your body has enough to be able to get change, but never at the expense of how stressed the body is or how much overall stress we're under, which means we get the maximum ability to recover from whatever the stimulus is. That is good strength training, and that will often protect your joints and your soft tissue health from injury as well. The last is I want you to monitor your intensity. So you should leave the gym feeling pretty energetic. At least within an hour, you should feel energized again. Now that's not going to be every session. That's not to say you can't train hard and you can't leave huffing and puffing. Of course you can. It's just, I don't want that to be the way that you structure every single workout, every time you're in the gym, which to be frank, just kicks your body's ass and gives it zero time to recover, which means you don't get to maximize the benefit of the training that you've been trying to do. I'm not saying it doesn't take away from a good hard run or a good hard exercise, like workout, strength workout can be great for your mental health, but it's just not giving you the benefit of what you're trying to do in terms of your body composition or strength progress. I'll open the floor. Vince or Jeffrey, any thoughts or feelings around what have we just talked about? I think listening to you, Sam, is just a good reminder. Like I had a, some people hassle me when I joined the gym and had a trainer and they're like, oh, why don't you just join like one of the franchise gyms and look stuff up um, on YouTube. There's so much to learn. There's so much to it in terms of being able to do it well and do it safely. So listening to all that stuff you've just gone through now has just uh, reminded me that it was worth doing that rather than just, I, I reckon I'd be seriously injured if I had to just tackle it on my own with YouTube clips. <laughs> I think um, that's lovely of you to say, by the way, but um, I think there's a really weird misconception that it's all really easy to do. Like health, results, nutrition, strength training, programming. While there's lots of information, I would say that 90% of the information that I read and the things that I see people do aren't very good if I'm being completely honest with you. And there's a reason that the fitness industry has such a bad reputation um, and so many people are getting injured in it. And it's because their thought process around how to train people and how to get the best results just doesn't come with the, the best foundational knowledge. Vince, anything you want to add or are we... I think we're. I think we might be okay. Anything else you've got, Jeffrey? We've got two more minutes. If there's anything you want to bounce off me, oh, just the the you mentioned the sauna too. I I definitely find my recovery is a lot better when I, after I've done a strength training session, squeezing in a sauna, it's worth every minute of it. Yeah, and it actually like what it's going to do is it just it severely reduces your cortisol load. So by initiating that drop in cortisol, you get that parasympathetic nervous system activity. And then when you're already ramping up your recovery process, it means later that night, not only will you probably have a better, like that reduction in cortisol is going to help produce more melatonin, which means you're going to get to bed better. It's going to then deepen the layers of sleep you get, which means more growth hormone, which means more muscle building, more fat burning. It's like, which people, and it, I know it's an extra 15 to 30 minutes, but the net benefit is astronomical from it. 